Ushers, if you'll come forward, please, we'll share in our offering together this morning as we do that. Just a couple of things for you, a couple of things to remind you of. I know that was, you saw the video and already mentioned Night to Shine. I just want to encourage you uh, to sign up to, to volunteer for Night to Shine. This past week, I uh, saw a young girl, not all that young, but one of our guests that had been here Night to Shine before, and so I, she was with a family member. And so I went up to her and I just said, can I excuse myself in and said, you know, uh, I'm Pastor Scott from Essex Lands Church, and I said, I, I don't remember your name, but I said, I know you were at Night to Shine, and more, she just, she just glowed, and I said, you know, Night to Shine is coming up, it's not going to be too long, and the family member, with tears in her eyes, said, I know, I know, and uh, I said, I hope you get to, you get to come this year, oh, we're signed up already, and uh, I said, were you excited, and the family member said, yeah, so excited, though, she, so excited that she can't wait for Christmas to be done so that uh, <laughs> night to shine will come. Uh, folks, we, have, we are honored to be able to participate in this night. If you have not volunteered, if you have not been able to be there, you have missed out on an incredible blessing. Uh, we have well over, I mean, over 100 people, of course, signed up already, participants. We're going to need buddies uh, sign up and be a part of that. It's a great, it's a great, great night, and we are honored to be a part of that. Uh, there's a table out in the uh, lobby for volunteers, and you can talk to the Davis. I hope you can... I hope you can participate in that and be a part of it. Just a reminder as we're coming up the, the, to uh, Christmas week, a reminder there are no services next Sunday morning here on this campus. Uh, there is a service at the North Avenue campus if you want to attend a, a church service on next Sunday. There are no services here as we're getting ready, of course, for the next day where there'll be... Uh, uh, I want to keep saying 12 services. There aren't 12 services. It'll just feel like that by it's done. Um, there, are, there are five services that start at 12 noon. So on Monday, we're getting ready for that day. And so by all means, use, use Sunday. It's a family day. Um, use it to, you know, again, Scripture says that, you know, we don't serve Sabbath. The Sabbath serves us. Uh, use that day in multiple ways. Please invite someone. Bring somebody with you on Christmas Eve. The first service starts at noon. Last one ends at, or starts at six. Uh, and and just invite someone to be a part of uh, that that day and be a part of uh, Christmas Eve together. So be aware again, no services next week here in this campus. Um, other thing, would just say this: with Christmas Eve, one of the things we do try to offer uh, is nursery care for a young baby, for the small babies, uh, just to give some parents a break that choose to have the baby in the nursery for that period of time where they have an hour where they could uh, worship. Uh, and perhaps not have to care for an infant. We have some neat area of needs. We have a couple services covered. We have a couple services that are not completely covered. Uh, go, on, go on the internet, go on our webpage, and you can find a place in which to volunteer uh, for a nursery in one of those services. That would be a great gift, a great gift to some of our parents that come and some of our visitors that will be here. If you can help us with that, that would be a, 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 a real great uh, blessing. So thank you for that already. Final word, last week. We have finished our series on money. I just want to remind you, it's as easy as one, two, three to experience uh, a new day and God blessing in your life. I want to thank you for some of the notes, some of the stories that have been incredible encouragement. Uh, some, some I've read, some of you've sent in, some of you, you've pulled me aside to tell me uh, some of the stories of uh, paying it forward and things like that. Um, it's been such an encouragement. I, I laugh. One, one, one of the stories that came in was very lengthy, and the person described their whole day. They came to church. It was a good, it was a good sermon. Uh, the pastor read a letter to his kids. It was pretty powerful. It was heartwarming. It tugged at my heartstrings. It was really good. And, uh, and then he called for an offering at the end. How bad is that? You don't do that. You, you know, you manipulated us. You know, you, it was the kind of thing that said, man, sure, you catch our heartstrings. And then you, and then you call for an offering. And then on top of that, it wasn't an offering offering. It was a reverse offering. You were giving money out and went back the opposite direction and ended, man, I love my church. They said, I just love my church and that we get to be a part of this. And so those kind of notes, um, one of our families in the church felt God calling them to give money and they're in need themselves, but to give money to someone in greater need. And they had $45 left, literally $45 left in their own checkbook. And uh, they had a $5 bill, and God was telling them to give five times the five, or 10 times the five, give, a 50, give $50 to this other person in need. And they said, man, my, my last uh, $45, my checkbook. But they said, I'm going to do it. And so they did it. Went and got the mail, opened up uh, the, the card for, with $50. Um, they took the step of faith and said, I'm going to do this, God, and God honored it. And some of us hear some of those things and say, man, why does that ever happen to me? Well, give God a chance. 
give God a chance because those things happen when we take those steps of faith. One family told me their story. They had been, they'd been here in the series. They'd been thinking about their giving and they had, the husband specifically had had a number in his head for a couple of weeks. It's like, I, I think we're supposed to increase our giving to the church by $400. I think we're supposed to do that. And then they found out just last week they found out that the daycare that they take their children to, they have two children, the daycare they take their children to had raised their rates imme- payable immediately $100 a week, $400 a month. And if anyone here have daycare issues, you know you don't just switch daycare providers, you don't, can't find them. And so immediately they now have to pay an additional $100 a week, $400 a month. Now, a lot of us would say, whoop, that's the sign, you know, I'm not going to do that, can't be $400. They took that number that they now had to pay additional 400, he goes, man, that's the same number I had in my head that I'm supposed, we're supposed to give, to give God. Confirmation, confirmation. And they said, we wrote our check. And they, they just, an attitude, they go, man, we can't wait to see what God does. Again, I wanna encourage you, one, two, three, trust God and see, see what he does in our lives. This morning, um, I wanna look at a Christmas message as we get ready, as we move into this week. And I gotta tell you, we're walking into the week that is one of my favorite weeks of the year. This is one of my favorite weeks, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, but I mean, it's now ramping up, and I'm looking forward to it. As I was getting ready for my sermon and preparing this past week, I'm, I'm easily distracted, as you probably can tell, easily distracted. I sit down to start to study, and it doesn't take anything for me just to get off, and somehow, in some other tangent, somehow, uh, a, a old commercial popped up. I don't know, I can't remember where or how it came up, but it was like, oh, remember the old commercial? So all of a sudden... Well, I'm supposed to be studying. I'm now looking at all old commercials. Uh, and man, you can do that for hours. I wouldn't suggest it if you have to preach on Sunday, but you could. And admittedly, in our life, probably like yours, when it comes to commercials, we either fast forward through them if they're recording them, um, or that's the time to go to the bathroom or go to the kitchen, you know, you got a commercial. But some of them are pretty good uh, that are out there that I, I love. Like, I love the, the, the mayhem commercials. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I just love the Allstate Mayhem, the guy who says, hi, I'm Mayhem. The latest one, you know, he's laying on a snow, I mean, he's snow, laying on a roof, and of course, the uh, you know, snow crashes through, and, and those kind of commercials, I like the one who says, I'm Mayhem. Actually, I'm a young teenage girl uh, texting while driving, and Johnny just said he doesn't like me, and it's like he drives the car into another park car. I'm Mayhem. I like the one where I'm, he's Mayhem, and he's a lost cell phone underneath the car seat. Uh, that's vibrating and the guy's trying to find it. I just love those commercials. Um, I love the one that's out there now from Geico. Grandpa playing the flight of the bumblebee on his nose while snoring. Now, not everyone in my house or home agrees that that's a great one. I love it. Um, But the part I love is not grandpa playing the flight of the bumblebee while he's snoring. I like it when the grandson, and if you haven't seen it, you gotta go look. The grandson goes up and pushes his nostril and changes his, his, his song to jazz. But that's not the good part. The good part is when they show the aunt who's sitting in the chair next to grandpa, and when he starts playing jazz with his nose, she's going. <laughs> I, just, I can rewind that over and over again. Um, well, you know, they have a bunch of them out. The one, the, Peyton Manning, and what's the um, country western? It doesn't really matter anymore. Forget that one. Um, <laughs> You know, that's out there. Uh, and, and even though we, we don't like some of the commercials, some of them have really stuck through the years, right? Now I'm gonna show my age a little bit, but here's some statements that became catchphrases because of commercials, like this one. Where's the beef? Wendy's commercial, and if you remember the commercial, it wasn't just a term, you had to see the woman. She was perfect, where's the beef? I've fallen and I can't get up. I use that frequently. Um, <laughs> frequently, but so far I can still get up. I'm expecting this Christmas to get a you know, the, the necklace so I can push a button because that's what happens to me. How about this one? I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Alka-Seltzer. I don't know if, you, if this really dates you, but you remember the Mean Joe Green commercial? Uh, mean Joe Green, great football player, limping his way down the, into the locker room and the kid gives him a Coke. I mean, there's a commercial that a lot of us, they kind of stick with us. I got to show you real quickly one of my favorites, one of my favorite old commercials. A very close call. Could have gone either way. It was right on the line. Well, Ferguson's not too happy with it. I can tell you that much. Oh, he's beating him like a rented mule. <laughs> and the ref's just tuning him out. Boy, where do you train to take a beating like that? You to say that you love me once in a while? 
Now, I don't know why I like that one so much. I just love the guy's, I just love the guy's look. It's just. And then I watched, I was clicking through some, and then I watched this one. Actually, I watched this one because I actually heard a song, and, I, and as soon as I heard the song, I thought of this commercial growing up as a kid. And so I went and played it, and just here's one last one to see. You'll remember it, I'm sure. Boys, your ketchup's slow. You mean your mom doesn't buy you Heinz? No, why should she? Wait till you taste it. You know, Heinz ketchup can solve all of your problems. You know, and I've never seen anyone put ketchup on a burger like that, but I heard that song. So here is the lead in, quite honestly. That song reminds me of what exactly I like about this week. It's the anticipation. And let's be honest, most good things in our lives, most great events we're going to do, if we're going to go on vacation, if we're having family come, depending on how you view, view that, I mean, some of those things in life that are the highlights, one of the great things about them is what? It's the anticipation of them. Man, we look forward to them, we wait for them, we can't wait for them, and this week comes, and here we go, man, I mean, excitement is, excitement is there, excitement's running high, anticipation is high, the fun is high, the joy is high, and then what happens? And then it comes, and then it's over, and then the excitement is gone, the anticipation is empty, the fun is over, and the joy, well, it's just a nice memory. So this morning, what I'd like to do as we get ready for Christmas, I'd like to talk about joy, and I'd like to talk about the idea of having joy beyond Christmas, not just joy at Christmas. Now listen to this verse from 1 Thessalonians 5.16, pretty straightforward, always be joyful. That's a pretty tall order, don't you think? And let's be honest, friends, if you decide today to say, you know what, I'm going to not read the Bible anymore, I'm just going to commit myself to living out just one simple little verse from the Bible, and this is the one. You wouldn't have to read the Bible yet again, and you have got yourself a lifetime of work ahead of you right there, right? Always be joyful. We're going to talk about joy this morning. We're going to talk about joy beyond Christmas, not just joy at Christmas, but joy after Christmas. I would suggest to you as a starting place that one of the biggest problems that we have when we talk about having joy is that we don't understand it. We don't understand joy. When you talk about joy, for a lot of people, they go, well, yeah, joy is an emotion. It's a, that we really can't control. I have joyful moments, but you know, it's like an emotion that comes and goes. That's wrong. It's not an emotion. Some people, when they think of joy, think of joy in terms of, well, it's a personality. You know, it's not my fault. I see these people who are like, joyful all the time, and that's not me. We think joy is a personality. That's not true. So we have a lot of misunderstanding. Let me put a picture up real quick of what joy is not as a starting place. Right there, joy is not. In the spirit of Christmas, joy is not Ebenezer Scrooge. I, I, someone looked at that and said, man, that's the most dark picture. Of it. I said, I looked for the, the worst picture I could find of Ebenezer Scrooge. Make no mistake, we think of not joy, we would easily think, okay, that's him. But now I'm thinking to myself, okay, what would be a picture I could put before you that would show joy? Well, what, you know, what we'd like to be. I, only, I can only come up with one. <laughs> Tigger. You look at Tigger and you just think joy. I mean, you just think joy. Now, if I were to do a quick survey and said, now, who would you rather be? Who would you rather more be like, Scrooge or Tigger? I guarantee people are going to go, well, I want to be more like Tigger. Now, which one is it easier to be? It's easier to be Scrooge. Because a lot of things in life that can, take, that can suck the life out of you. There's a lot of issues that can take place in life. And the problem with the Tigger type of thing is this. I don't know anyone who can pull off Tigger you? Tigger's always up. Tigger's always on top of the world. Tigger always has a positive attitude. Tigger always sees everything as, man, it's going to be another great day. I don't know anybody who can pull that off. So the problem, if you, if is a starting place, remember, joy is not just an emotion. Joy is not just a personality thing. Let me give you a couple of statements. If you take nothing else away from the day, listen very carefully to this next minute and a half. 
Joy is an awareness of the presence of God in your life that changes everything. Joy is the awareness of the presence of God. And that awareness of the presence of God can actually change your personality and can change your emotions. It changes perspective. It changes how we see things. It even gives us to the ability to see the invisible. That's what joy does. The awareness of God that produces in us strength and confidence. You see, when you have joy, you can lose your job and still maintain your joy, regardless of circumstance. You can lose a loved one. That doesn't mean you have to lose your joy. You can lose your job, you can lose your health, you can even lose your life, and still have the presence of joy in your life. So how do you find that kind of joy? How do you find it? That joy that lasts through difficulty, that joy that, that, though, that though sometimes this world can be pretty ugly, that joy that goes through the ugliest of moments, and comes out strong and resolute. Well, the Christmas story's got something to share with us. I said it's a Christmas message, and I actually want to look at the Christmas story, because in the Christmas story this morning, we're going to see different characters in the story, and they're going to teach us some things about joy. They're going to teach us how to have joy well beyond Christmas. Not just a theme that we'll talk about now, but the approach to take that would offer us the picture of joy well after Christmas and well after everyone's gone, and when we're in the middle of life. Now, here's where we begin in the story. The story is in Luke chapter two. Jesus has been born. He's been wrapped in strips of cloth. He's been lying in a manger. And here's where we pick up with the shepherds in Luke chapter two, verse eight and nine. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Before we go any further, would you bow your heads? Father, this morning, we need your Holy Spirit to speak into our lives. We come here this morning with different re- for different reasons, different agendas. Some are here to, to visit a friend or a family member. Some walked in the first time not even knowing why they were here, but thought they'd try out church. Others, are here, other, others of us are here every week. Some are here angry or bothered, and some are here broken and hurting. You know all the reasons I pray right now to the power of your, power of your Holy Spirit that you would come into every heart, the hardest of heart, the angriest of heart, the most broken of hearts, the most bruised of hearts, and that your spirit be felt in our lives, that your truth this morning would change us. We give you this time in Jesus' name, amen. You ever been to a large mall, been to a large place like a fair, a large fair, or maybe a convention center, and you're trying to find your way around, and you go to the kiosk, and you find where it says, you are here. We were in Montreal not too long ago, and if you've been to Montreal, you know that there's an underground shopping mall, and that shopping mall covers about 19 miles, 19 to 20 miles. In some buildings, it goes up and down seven stories, and then miles and miles. And so I wanted to figure out where we were, and so I found the little kiosk that says, you are here, and when you see where you are, in light of 19 miles of stuff, you have no idea where here is. You just go, I'm here, and all I know is I got a circle around me, but I have no idea where here is. But you've done that, right? When you've had to find something, and if not a kiosk, it's here, you bring out your phone or your GPS, you put out Google, and it says, you know, I am here, and I want to go there. So you push the there in, and now you're going to follow the, follow your way to that place. And a lot of times, we think of joy in that context. It's the path that we have to take. It's the journey to get someplace. You know, in the next, in the next intersection, turn left to joy in 300 feet. That kind of thought process. Well, let me give you the first thing we learned from our story about joy. And that truth is this. Joy is here. Joy is here. If, if you are here, if you're looking at the, the kiosk and it says, you are here, then I want to tell you, joy is right where you're at. If you are here, joy is here. Joy is not 300 feet away that you have to find out how to get there. Joy is not in the other end of the mall where you've got to figure out the pathway. Joy is here. The shepherds discovered joy right where they were at. Now, where were they? You say, well, they're in a field. Yeah, I got that. But where were they? The shepherds were in the same place where they have been every day of their lives. The shepherds found joy right where they lived. It was just another night for them, just another night as usual, doing the normal, doing the routine, same old, same old, life as usual, and joy shows up. Joy shows up right here, right there where they were at. 
That's how God does it. That's how God shows up in our lives, right where you're at. If you are right here, joy is right here with you. You don't have to go on vacation to find joy. You don't have to have money to find joy. You don't have to go buy things to find joy. Why is that? Because right here is where you need joy. I mean, in a, it doesn't quite apply the same way because we, we, I'm using the worldly definition of joy, now not biblical, but let's be honest. You don't typically need joy in vacation because joy is the vacation, right? I don't need joy in vacation because it is the distraction of life. And so I don't need joy there. Man, when you got a pocket full of money and you're buying stuff left and right, who needs joy because I have that? But the problem is you can't live on vacation. You got to come home. You don't live at the workplace. You have to come home. You don't have pockets full of money all the time. It runs out, and now you're back at home. So why is joy here? Because God knows that's where you need joy. We don't live on vacation. We live at home. And I like the part of the verse where it says that suddenly, they're out in the fields, they're watching their sheep over their flocks, watching over their sheep, and suddenly an angel shows up. Suddenly God shows up. I like the word suddenly because that's where we live, right? We live in a very suddenly world. I mean, bad news always comes in our lives suddenly. Things always go south suddenly in our lives. Very seldom is it a slow progression, but suddenly we get bad news. And suddenly we get a phone call. And suddenly we have an accident. And suddenly things get worse. Now listen very carefully to this next statement. Most of us live in the world of suddenly. Suddenly everything goes south. But listen very carefully. Just as suddenly as everything can go south is as suddenly as everything can change in the opposite direction when joy shows up. You see, we live in a suddenly world where, yeah, things get bad with the suddenly, but do you recognize that things can get great with the suddenly? When joy shows up, when God shows up, things can go the opposite direction. Right here, right now, suddenly, God can do something new. Hope where there was no hope. Light suddenly where there was darkness. And that's what happened to those shepherds. And suddenly, God showed up. Joy is here. That's the first truth. A lot of us will go on these journeys to find joy. I want you to know, joy is right in front of you. But keep going, verse 10. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Joy is not something that you have to go out and find. The second thing I want you to know is that joy is sent. Joy is not something to have to go out and get. Joy is sent. So if joy is sent to you, then here's the second truth. Then joy must be accepted. If we're going to experience joy, you have to accept joy. Joy is sent to us. The joy of God is given to us. And if we're going to experience it, then we have to accept it. The world is full of people trying to find joy and have multiple different strategies to do so. And in this room, this place, the video cafe, is filled with people that at different times in our lives, we have gone on the search for joy with all sorts of strategies. Some of us will work harder. We're thinking, if I can make more, if I can get more, that'll be the path to joy. Some will try to, uh, to get joy by ignoring bad. Denial is a wonderful way to try to get joy. I'm just going to pretend that and nothing's bad in this world. And so we go in denial as our pathway to joy. Some hope to stumble upon joy. And some of us walk through life thinking, you know, I know it's out there. It's just a matter of when it shows up and I'm going to stumble upon it like the lottery. I love the advertisements for the lottery where it says, hey, you never know. And it makes you feel, you, know, you watch that and you kind of go, yeah, you never know. Hey, you never know. You never know that you might be the one in 340 billion people that might win. But hey, you never know. And it's, it's incredible that the odds are so bad. And yet when they say you never know, we've got all sorts of people go, huh, you're right. You never know. <laughs> we got a flyer in the mail this, about two weeks ago from a car dealership. And it, you know, it basically says, you never know. In bottom line, if you don't play, you can't win. And look at the thing, you could win 25,000, you could win uh, 10,000, you could win 2,500. And it's like, yeah, you're not going to win 25,000. But I look at the thing and it says, you know, pull off the little sticker and see what you mean, blah, blah, blah. So I do that and I look and it says $2,500. $2,500. That's not 25,000, but you, you're going to, you know, you thumb your nose at 2,500? 2,500. So I'm looking at this thing because we all know this can't be. So I read this thing front, I mean, front to back, top to bottom. I go through every single line looking for what's the catch, because we all know that's the catch. 
It even says odds one in 60,000. Well, that's not as bad as one in you know, one a billion. And hey, in a row. And so I look at this thing and I can't find anything and it matches. This little num the number here, the little token thing matches the little scratch off down here, which says $2,500. And everything I can see says winner. And so I said to Diane, I go, yeah, look at this. So she looks and she, I, 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 yeah, I can't find. We send to our kids because, you know, we're getting old enough in our life now that we can't work the VCR. Of course, that's broken now, but we, um, we can't operate anything electronically, so we call the kids, you know, to come and do it. And, and so we show the kids because, you know, they'll know. So we send it to them, and they'll look at it. Yeah, can't, can't find anything. So we're going to go to do this, and we realize that you can only do it on a certain day, on Tuesday. Uh, that's when it happened for four days. And I'm out of town. And so I'm out of town, so I said, well, Diane, you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, lived, I was legitimately out of town. And she goes, well, yeah, it, it was addressed to her anyway. Because it did say, you know, you have to be the winner. So I said, she goes. So I'm in my meeting down in Boston, and I get a text that just says, ugh. I go, up, oh, there it goes. I said, what did they say? She said, well, it says that I walk in, I show them everything, and they go, well, it doesn't have just to match your card, but your number has to match our card. It's like, where does it say that? So instead of $2,500, we get a $10 gift card to Walmart. <laughs> that could take up to 30 days to process. So there you have that. <laughs> so a lot of people view this joy thing like the lottery. Like, you know, maybe I'll stumble on it. And, and, I'll, and, and if, I, if I keep doing the right things, maybe it'll come to me. Friends, God wants to bring you joy. God wants to bring joy into every single life. And so he sends joy. It doesn't have to be found. Joy is not created contrary to a new cultural thought process. Joy is not created from, some, from grabbing a hold of some positive energy deep within and channeling it. Joy comes from above. It's an eternal thing that God sends our way. Now, look at verse 10, and just going back to that text. It says, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. There's a, there's, a, there's a real nugget there that you may have to make sure you get. Good news that will bring great joy. He says, I'm bringing you some good, good news that's going to bring great joy. That's easy, easy to understand. You see, when I get a letter in the mail that says, Scott, you have won a million dollars, man, that's good news. And when someone hands me the check for a million, now that's great joy, right? And what's the difference between getting a letter that says that you've won a million and you actually hold the million in your hand? It's personal. It gets personal. See, anyone can get a letter, and it's good news, but you kind of go, well, maybe, but the really good news is when it happens. See, it becomes personal. Folks, Christmas could not be any more personal. Make sure you understand the story of Christmas. It could not be any more personal. Jesus came for you. Joy is for you. Jesus says, I came for you. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. I have a future for you. Christmas is personal. Remember, joy is the awareness of the presence of God in your life that changes everything. Now, a quick question for you. If you're a follower of Christ and joy is the awareness of the presence of God in your life that changes everything, then why do some of us look so non-joyful? Hmm. Maybe you are missing the awareness of the presence of God in your life. Verse 17 in our story. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them, the shepherds, of course. When they had gone and seen the child, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. Now, these verses tell us that one of the sure signs of someone who has joy, someone who has met Jesus, someone who has legitimately met the giver of joy, look what they do, they tell somebody else about it. It says that one of the signs of joy is that they share the joy. Joy tells others. Joy infects others. In fact, let me say a, a, a negative side of this because I think you have to hear this. Bottled up joy soon turns sour. You see, joy is meant to be shared. Bottled up joy soon turns sour. So for those of us who have experienced joy... For those of us have, who have genuinely experienced the joy of Christ in our lives already, please, please, for heaven's sake, invite someone to Christmas Eve. 
If, if you have experienced the joy of Christ in your life, please invite someone with you. Those invite cards, you know, they're good till next Monday. Please use them and bring someone with you for Christmas. I'll give you a little uh, preview of what to expect. If you, in your life, if you've ever gotten a bad present where you open and you go, oh. And you know how when it's a bad present, the higher your voice goes, oh. If you've ever gotten a bad present, come on Christmas Eve. If you know anyone that you think in their life, they've probably got a bad present along the way, come on Christmas Eve. If you've experienced the joy of Christ in your own life, please bring someone with you. Joy is sent, but when accepted, it's then shared and experienced. Catch that? Joy is sent, but not until it's accepted is it experienced. And when it is accepted, it is shared. Now listen to this. This might explain why some of us don't experience the joy of Christ in an ongoing way. See, joy not shared will soon become joy not experienced. Make sure you heard that. Joy not shared will soon become joy not experienced. You lose your joy. And that's how we lose it. We don't share it. So joy is here. That's the first truth. Second truth is joy must be accepted because it's sent to us. And let me give you the third one. And that is this. Joy is the missing piece of life. The third thing about joy we learn from our, our characters in the story is that joy is actually the missing piece of life. Joy is a journey. Joy is a process. And we come to the part of the story where the wise men come into the story. Remember, they saw a star, and then they began their journey to joy. They saw the star and began this process, this journey to go find joy. Now, here's the story in Matthew chapter 2. There's two verses, and we jump down to two more verses. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And then it says, verse 10, and when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Now, if you're sharper than most, and you appear to be just that, you're thinking to yourself, hey, now wait a minute. You just got done saying that joy is here. It's not out there. You don't have to go find it. And yet you just said that joy is a journey and that these wise men went out on their journey to find joy. So Scott, that's the opposite of what you said just a minute ago. So which one exactly is it, Scott? So first of all, let me say, I don't appreciate your tone. <laughs> right up front. Second thing I would say, just stick with me for a moment. You see, the wise men knew that there was something missing. Go back and know the story of the wise men, and you'll remember that they were searching the skies for a star because they knew that there was a missing piece. They knew that God had promised the coming of the Messiah, and the Messiah would be the missing piece that this world desperately needed, and they knew that that piece was missing. So they were watching, and they were waiting. The, the looking into the stars was the picture of them knowing there was something else. And they're watching, and they're looking, and they're watching and waiting. And then it tells us that suddenly God puts a star in space. The star comes up announcing that the missing piece is now on earth. The missing piece, the one who can answer all of the mysteries of life. The one who would have the answers to the great questions of why are we here and where are we going and what's it all about. The one who could offer hope, the one who can offer real peace, the one who can actually offer joy. You see, people all know deep inside their hearts that there's something missing. That's why we go after things. That's why we go after things like that money can buy because the things might help us. That's why we pursue our careers. That's why we pursue all these things in life. It might be a hobby, it might be music. We pursue a lot of things and oftentimes it's the pursuit of these things in, in which to somehow fill this void. You sort of say, well, I really like to golf. I love to golf. It really, it really does something for me. Well, it, golf's a great thing. Hobbies are great things. But oftentimes we go after these things to kind of fill what's missing. And joy is what it is. Joy is the missing piece. When you meet Jesus, you figure out he's the part that's been missing. So the journey piece, when I say joy is his journey, it's really a journey of the heart. The heart keeps looking for where I can find that which is missing. Now make sure you catch this part of the story just to, just to help your clarity in the Christmas story. Catch this next part. 
You see, most people, most of us have the picture of the star put in place by God, kind of like the arrow on, on your Google Maps, directing and guiding the wise men. We have this picture that here is the wise men. God puts a star in place, and so they see it, and now the star begins to move, and they follow the star. We even have some songs written about the wise men following the star. And we have this picture that the star is moving, moving them, leading them to the place of Christ. Well, I've got to tell you, that's not quite what the Scripture teaches. That's not quite what the text says. In fact, if you go back and look in, in verse 2 of that passage we just read, it says that when we saw, his, we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. It didn't say they were following the star, the star. They said we've come to worship him, and we know that he's here because we saw his star. The star went up in space, and we saw it. The star went up and stood there. And so then they traveled to Jerusalem. Some would say, well, then how would they know to travel to Jerusalem if the star wasn't leading them there? Well, read the story. It says they were looking for the king of the Jews. Jerusalem was the center of the Jewish world. If you were going to go look for the king of the Jews, where do you think you might look? Jerusalem. You say, well, how would you find your way there? Well, if you look at the old ancient maps, you will find that here's Jerusalem, and east to west is one main road, and guess where it runs? Right through Jerusalem. Any other paths that go north and south, guess where they run? Right through Jerusalem. So just about any direction you can be at, you can head to Jerusalem, just head east or head west, wherever you're at, and follow the path, and guess where it takes you? It takes you to Jerusalem. So they didn't need a star to lead them to Jerusalem. They're looking for the king of the Jews. That makes sense. Let's go there. And when you get to Jerusalem, where's the most logical place to look for a king? Let's go to the king's palace. So they go to Herod. And if you read the story, you will find they go to Herod. They say, we're looking for the king of the Jews. Herod says, you know, wait here. Let me go find out if I can find out where this king is born at. He goes, he pulls all of his religious, religious leaders together. He says, what's the deal with the king? You know what they tell him? Read the story. They come back and they go, uh, you know, the prophets say that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So again, read the story. Herod comes back to the wise men and says to them, Bethlehem's where you want to go. Sets him in the direction. In fact, I've been, been there many, many times. You can almost picture Herod coming out, standing at a high point in the, in the palace and saying, listen, you're going to go to Bethlehem. Where is it? Third mountain over. You can see the tip of Bethlehem right over there. Just take that path right there. That'll take you right there. And then the story goes on, and Scripture goes on to tell us that what took place next is that when they heard the king, when they heard Herod in verse 9, they went on their way. They came out, when they came out to go on their way, after he said, go to Bethlehem, they came out and they saw the star, and the star started moving then, not because they couldn't figure out how to get to Bethlehem, but it actually stopped over the right place, so they found the Bethlehem, they found the house, and I love the end of the verse, and it says, and when they saw that star again, they were overjoyed. Their joy was full. Their joy was complete. You know, overflowing joy means joy complete. See, joy is what was missing. Joy is what we long for. But let me also remind you that joy, just like in this story with the wise men, there is a process to it. And what I mean by that is this. There's no such thing as quick fix joy. There's no such thing as checkbox joy which means I've got this list of things, I'm going to check them off, and if I do this and this and this and this and this, then I will have joy. It doesn't exist. That's not how you get it. See, people are all looking for this once and for all deal where they say, hey, I gave my life to Jesus, I want joy, I got it, and now everything's going to be joyful from this point on. No. Joy is an ongoing process. Now catch this. Joy is the ongoing process of a growing awareness of the presence of God. You see, if joy is the awareness of the presence of God, then ongoing joy is the growing awareness of the presence of God. Remember, if joy isn't shared, it sours. And if joy isn't growing, then it stops being satisfying. Again, I think that's why some of us don't seem real joyful. Because, you see, we kind of go at this approach, say, well, I gave my life to Jesus. I said yes to him once, and I want joy. Yeah, I got it. But a walk with God is a growing walk with God. It's a daily walk with God. And if your approach is, you know, I'm not much into the daily walk with God, then you're not much into satisfying joy. Because satisfying joy happens when we grow with God every day and he brings more and more joy. Keep moving in the story. Let me give you a fourth thing about joy. Two more. Fourth thing is this. Joy can be scary. Now, this is counter, counterintuitive, right? Joy can be frightening. And you go, wait a minute, how can that be? Well, let me give you a, a little look here in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 34. 
Simeon blessed them, but then said to Mary, a sword shall pierce your soul, for the child shall be rejected by many in Israel, and this to their undoing, but he will be the greatest joy to many others, and the deepest thoughts of many hearts shall be revealed. Here's the next part of the story. Uh, Mary and Joseph bring the baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. They bring the baby to the temple to be dedicated, which would be the custom of the day, but they bring him, and at the temple, there's a guy named Simeon. Simeon is this godly guy who's been at the temple worshiping God, who's believing God to to be truthful and honest, meaning this. Simeon is there, and Simeon knows that God had promised the Messiah. So Simeon goes to the temple every day to worship God, and he's trusting that the Messiah is going to come. Now, how does he get that and no one else does? Because you have, you have a whole world, you have a whole country that doesn't get the fact that Messiah is coming and coming soon. But somehow Simeon gets it. He goes there every single day to worship, believing that he is going to see the Messiah. And here comes Joseph and Mary with Jesus. Simeon asks to hold Jesus. And when he holds Jesus, he then offers this prayer. And if you want to go read it, it's a powerful prayer. But one of the things he says in his prayer is this. He goes, you know, Lord, you promised the Messiah. You gave me the promise. I'd get to see the the coming of the Messiah. I'm holding him in my hands. Man, you can take me home. Father, you have completed your promise to me. I'm ready to go because I have seen the fulfillment of your word. And it says in his prayer, this piece, he says to Mary, he turns to Mary and says this, Jesus is going to be the undoing of many. And yet to others, he will be the greatest joy of all. You see, what does that mean? Some translations say this, that Jesus will cause the falling of some and the rising of others. So be sure to hear this. Every person who hears about Jesus Christ, the fact that you are here and you've heard the story of the coming of the Messiah, every single person who hears about Jesus Christ has to decide what they're going to do with Jesus, right? I stand before you and say, Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. As soon as you hear those words, you have to make a decision. You have to, you're forced to. There's no neutral, there's no middle ground, there's no saying, ah, I won't decide. You're making a decision. Either he is the Messiah and you follow him or you reject him and you follow you. Ultimately, we either follow Christ or we follow us. That's the bottom line. You have to make that decision. No neutral. For those, for those who Jesus is their undoing, because he says to some they're gonna be in their undoing. They're gonna, it's, he's gonna be their undoing because of this. All of a sudden, they got to make a decision about Jesus, and they decide, nope, I want to follow me, and that will be their undoing. That'll be their undoing. For those of us that refuse to follow him, for those that might be here refusing to follow him, refuse to let him uh, to take control of your life, refuse to give over to him your life and, and the running of your life and the agendas of your life, it's going to be the undoing. It's going to be the undoing of us. You see... What happens is this, I believe in myself or my good works or my deed, my good deeds. And if you're not going to give over to Jesus Christ, the, the due following he deserves, then I'm going to stick with that and they're going to lead to my, my downfall. They're going to be my, my stumbling block. Jesus is the one that's going to cause me to fall. The scary thing about accepting God's joy, you say, what's scary about it? The scary thing about accepting God's joy in your life, accepting Jesus Christ into your life, is that to accept him, you're going to have to let go of whatever it is that you've been trusting already for your joy. See, if you've been doing all sorts of other things to get your joy, and you're sure that your things, your money, or your possessions, or your relationships, those are bringing the joy, you're going to have to let go of those who embrace him. That can be a scary thing. Scary thing to let go of what you believed your whole life was the source of your joy and to actually accept Christ as the the source of your joy. Herod is the perfect example from the story. King Herod is the perfect example. Herod would not bow down to any other king. He was the king, and so it was to his undoing. So for those people that refuse to follow Jesus, it will be to their undoing. And we've been talking these past weeks about money and about, about trusting God. Your freedom and peace always come at the other side of f- facing our fear. That's where freedom comes. Joy can be scary at first, but becomes greater and greater every time you push past your fear. Last one, and we close, is this. Joy is a choice. The last truth about joy that a lot of us miss is that joy is really a choice. And usually, you're not going to like this piece, it usually isn't an easy choice. Listen to these two passages, and they're from Mary. Here's where Mary comes into the story. 
So here is Luke chapter 1, verse 46. Mary responded, oh, my soul, how my soul re- praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he took notice of this lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. Mary has an awful lot of joy. I mean, this is actually a song. If you read Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, if you read her song, you will find that she is so happy. She is so filled with joy. She doesn't just say these words. She starts singing these words. She just starts singing a song. It's Mary's song. That's how joyful she is. But please know that's not where she starts. Here's where she starts in verse 29. Confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, also fear, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. There are three words that describe where Mary started in the story. Confused, disturbed, and afraid. That's where she started. She ends up singing a song of the abundant blessing of God. And get this, she's singing this song as a pregnant teenager who's not married in a culture where they could stone her for such a thing. Man, how do you get there? How do you get from confused and disturbed and afraid to joyful and to blessed and to singing? What happened? Friends, she made a choice. It's that simple. She chose to believe God. Please know in the whole process when the angel shows up to her and says, hey Mary, you found favor with God. She could go, yeah, right. I can say to you, man, your best life is ahead of you if you trust God. Yeah, right. Your choice. The choice we all have with joy is to choose it. The choice we have with Jesus Christ is to choose him. So how about you? Are you willing to do that in your life? Are you willing to take whatever area it is in your life where you are frightened, where you're afraid, where you're you're resistant to take a step of faith? Are you willing to say, I'm going to trust you? Maybe it's your money, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's with your kids, maybe your health. Maybe you got the relatives coming over this week. Could be good or bad, could go either way. Probably good and bad, will go either way. Kind of the way it goes. How about trusting him with your life if you've never given your life to Christ? How about there? But even even for those of us who are followers of Christ, where is it in our walk with God where God would say, trust me with this, joy, is a choice. Christmas Day is going to come. Presents, food, all those things. Man, it's going to be a good day. But how about joy beyond Christmas? Every day. Your choice. Joy is a choice. Boy, I hope you chose wise, choose wisely. Please stand. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these truths. Oh, so many times I find myself down, upset, angry, hurt. Uh, I mean, people say things and do things, and man, they can get right to us. And all of a sudden, I begin to realize, man, I don't have to live down here. I can live up. I can live with joy. But joy is not just something I'm going to automatically choose because I can check the box. Joy is the growing awareness of your presence in my life that changes things. Oh, remind us of that truth this week. But beyond this week, remind us of this truth every day of our lives, a growing awareness of the presence of God that changes our emotion, changes our personality, changes our outlook, changes our perspective. May that be so in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.